Here we are. So thank you so much, Sally, for bringing us all together today to talk about this, for, um, for opening up the conversation. As mental health champion, I'm going to talk about um, gaps in services and lack of visibility. Um, so the impact of domestic and sexual abuse on men ultimately is on mental health. Uh, and that's the stuff I want to talk about. Services, what this looks like, visibility, and what we need to do. So it's a story about mental health, but I don't have the figures or anything for victimisation and all of that. So we'll be getting that after this, but hopefully this will be useful um, as part of the bigger picture. I always start at everybody. Now it changes every time my service of survival slide, but this is, oh, there's no arrows there. Hang on. Can you see my, yeah, the arrows are there now. Okay, so this is this is just to remind us all that we are animals, and we're all humans, regardless of our gender or whatever. We 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 are all all humans, and we have within us a stress response. So this this is what this is what mental illness is all about. What mental illness is? Your, your one minute lecture on mental illness. It's about our body's response to stress, to things that have happened to us. Um, so whenever we're under stress or pressure or stress response, our fight or flight system goes off. You've heard this a lot. It's a biological response. We must never be ashamed and um, always compassionate towards ourselves because we have this. Um, and when it goes off, we change. We, we, we are designed to, to shift into this pattern where we can fight or run away. So our body, we're mobilized, we're vigilant, and we can become aggressive because we need to be aggressive in order to survive. Um, and we get angry and we, we work out we, who's against us, who we have to, to, to find here to, to target. So, um, so we're up there and then we go back down into safe and social. And that is emotional regulation. If we have too much stress or stress that we can't cope with, this thing gets broken. We get stuck up in fight or flight. And the third bit is shut down. And that is again, that's the body's way of protecting the brain from huge trauma from things that we need to process in stages because it would be overwhelming if we, if we were to, to bring it on at the same time. So the shutdown response is nearly like when the animal plays dead. So I live out in the country and this is what sheep do when they're giving birth, they go all quiet. And it helps them survive, they play dead so predators don't believe them because they think that, that's, a, that's a dead animal. So it's disconnected, terrible, this is, and that's like depression in the top, but it's like anxiety. Um, so, the calibration of this is set before a person's born and also in the first few years of life. The triggers to launch us up here and down there. Um, childhood factors are really important, but it's lifelong as well. So it's HPA, hypothalamic pituitary axis activation, and it leads to changes in feelings and behaviours. How we feel and how we behave. And it's those patterns of feelings and behaviours that are mental health and mental health difficulties and well-being. If we're feeling okay or good most of the time, then we have good, good mental health, and we can function in our roles, and we can behave in a way that means we can make a constructive contribution to society. Um, if we're feeling bad, we can't, we can't work, we can't do our things, we can't do the things that make life worth living for us. So it's about feelings and behaviours. Um, and, and that, that, so that's what mental health and mental illness is. But it's, it's stuff that happens to us that leads to these changes and the stuff in the first few years of life are really important. So mental health is biological, it's about our stress response and some other biological stuff there as well. It's psychological, it's about our thoughts and feelings and it's also relational, it's about the social context and the relationships that we have. Okay. And that relationship stuff incidentally is also physiological. We have mirror neurons that allow us to detect when we, when we are in a safe environment, when we're not being threatened. So I can look out now and I can see the whites of your eyes and I know that, that there's probably nobody going to attack me and I can tell subconsciously. You know, so all of that stuff is hugely important. So our relationships, knowing that we're connected, parts of community, that's what keeps us safe and well regulated and mentally well as well. So we can imagine if anything gets in the way of those relationships and the social context, that's a huge impact on our mental health too. So taking it back to those feelings and behaviours, feelings are so, so important. Um, and feelings are data. It's really important that we know how we feel so that we can start to problem solve to support ourselves. So it's important to get to the feelings before the behaviour. The behaviour is nearly the last stage of it. So that self-awareness of how we're feeling 
and then acting to change those feelings. It's fundamental to good mental health. Um, and the women are very good at it. We give our little girls and we, we give them dolls and we, you know, we show them and we show them how to be emotional and we reward them for expressing their feelings. Um, and we don't do that. Little boys are socialised completely differently. Um, and and that, that's really quite harmful because what we're doing is we're not training them to identify and respond to their feelings. Now many, many boys have this and schools are getting really good at this stuff. But traditionally it hasn't been the case. And if you've got that sort of poor awareness of how you're feeling, then that can get in the way of problem solving, of connecting, of doing the things to get you back into good mental health and well-being. And of course, that, those are the first signs of mental illness, those feelings. So if we don't know how we're feeling and we can't act to change them, we can't talk about our feelings, then we can never get help for our mental health. And sometimes, let me tell you, if there's a lot of stress and a lot of trauma, when we get stuck in those different states, and we need help to get back out of that. Sometimes the chemicals work, but usually it's about working with somebody then to get, to get us back into safe and social and doing what we need to be well again. So I did this survey last year, it was part of the, the Northern Ireland Life and Time survey, and we asked about attitudes to mental health and mental illness, and thankfully most of the attitudes, that, the positive attitudes that we want people to have, you know, asking someone for help to deal with a mental illness is wrong, but we don't think of that anymore, most people don't think. There's less of a stigma, yes, there is less of a stigma, and people feel there's less of a stigma. But this one here was very interesting. I find it difficult to talk to other people about my feelings and emotions. And you know what? This is fundamental. We can know that it's okay to be, you know, not to be okay. It's okay to per mental health, ask for help. But if we can't identify our own feelings and communicate them in our relationships and our families and our communities and the workplace, you know, we won't be able to manage our mental health. We won't have that self-awareness and behaviours that happen when people haven't responded to their feelings and haven't identified that those feelings are data that need to be acted upon. That, that's really, really damaging. Um, so a lot of people in Northern Ireland have difficulty discussing their feelings. 40% um, of women and 49% of men. And it was only 38% in 2015, so it's got worse. We're shutting down. You know, we're, we're talking the talk on social media. We're saying, oh yeah, it's okay. I talk about your mental health, please do. But are we talking about our own feelings? Are we aware even of our own feelings? Um, and again, this is so important because all of those harmful stereotypes around what it means to be male, you're, just, you're not allowed to have feelings. I mean, of course that's a recipe for poor mental health. And if something's happening in your relationship, it's also affecting your mental health. You need to be able to communicate about this stuff. So as a society, it starts here. It starts with what we do in terms of little boys and socialisation. And it starts with allowing everyone to have feelings and to talk about those feelings and to help people who have difficulties in with their mental health work things out so that we can get those changes in feelings and behaviour to make people well again. So, um, this is another source of data that I've been using a lot recently. This is a recent study, it's a really strong study of young people's mental health in Northern Ireland, um, conducted in 2019 prior to the pandemic. Um, so, in Northern Ireland, one in eight, around one in eight of our young people have a mood or anxiety disorder. And those are, when we talk about mental health, that's what we think about depression and anxiety. So if you, if you were to do a straw poll here, people would say they're feeling bad, not being able to get out of bed, that's depression, that's anxiety. That is only one category of mental health problems. And those are the internalizing disorders. So if you think of our fight or flight and our freeze response, you know, that, free, that freeze response, that withdrawal, that's like the internalizing. But the fight or flight is about acting out, it's about externalizing, it's about the behavior. And, and actually, because of the way our society socialises little boys, um, that is how they manifest it's their behaviours that look differently whenever they're under stress and pressure. So, um, interestingly, I thought 12% uh, of boys and 13% of girls have mood or anxiety disorders. You know, we, we have this idea that girls are more affected by this stuff, but when you do your research and you ask the questions, right, this is what you find. Our little boys are suffering in the same way, even with those internalizing disorders that are characteristic of girls and um, mental health problems. And one in ten have conduct problems. And conduct problems are externalizing. And they're the same thing, it's just a response to stress, particularly in you know, each child. 
But what do we do? We label it as bad behaviour and we exclude children. And, and particularly little boys, this happens to little boys. They are excluded, they are further harmed because of the fact of how they, they act in response to stress and pressure and trauma. And this study showed us that boys aged 5 to 10 years had significantly higher levels of major depressive disorder, separation anxiety, social anxiety, generalized anxiety, panic disorder, and OCD in theirs. And actually, the differences here are really, really stark. And this is in five-year-olds, right? That, that is a worry. I am, but this, this, we should, this is alarm bells, like little boys. And I'll show you some of the graphs so you can see what's happening in terms of the gender patterns here. So oppositional defiant disorder, that is a, a psychiatric disorder. It's a recognized DSM disorder. Look, the left, so this is top graph, left male, female. Um, much higher in our boys. And what happens often means the, the title says it all. Defiant little boys, oppositional, challenging. Out of the classroom, excluded from school, knocked into prison, blamed. You're the problem. Not about what's happened to you. You're the problem. You're a problem child. You're a problem. Society's a problem with you. What are we going to do with you? It's terrible. It's really, really oppositional defiant disorder. Similar thing, you know. And particularly though, in that five to ten age group. And this, this study was based on parental um, reports as well. And, the, and incidentally, the measures are really good, and it'll all be published in peer review journals in due course too. Conduct problems, the strengths and difficulties questionnaire, again, really good measure of your mental health, of mental health generally. Much higher in boys. You, you see there in GERS, right, it's quite high in the two to four. You know, I just been through this period with my five year old, so I know what they're like. But somehow GERS learn that this is not how you behave when you're under stress. This is not what you do, so it goes through. The stress, the, the causes are still the same. Hyperactivity, there we go. Well, we, we medicate this. You know, rather than recognize it. And, and sometimes medication is absolutely necessary, a good way of dealing with it. I've used medication myself. Um, peer problems, much higher. And relationships, important to mental health, relationships in school. And it just continues as to acute pro social behavior problems. Again, we, 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 we get the gears to do this stuff really well, but the boys, forgotten about. It. Well, not forgotten about. It. Deprivation, much higher in the most deprived areas because there's more stress and more pressure. Always oh, throw that in, Pop. I'm glad you mentioned it too, Robbie. Depression, these are our measures of now what we consider to be the more sort of socially acceptable mental health problems. Um, again, males high gears, it gets, it gets higher. So they internalize. We, we get the externalizing stuff, we manage their behavior in such a way that they know that, that they don't act out. They internalize. And it's really bad, like 10% there um, of gears. And the 16 to 19 age gap, that's horrific. Like, you know, that's a key period as well when they're doing exams and the pressure's really on. Separation anxiety again goes way up. So we, we train girls to internalize and boys externalize. Girls get support with their mental health and services are there to, to meet their needs. You know, they're very feminized services and they're staffed by women a lot of the time too, and that's great. You know, but what, what's happened to boys in the meantime? Social anxiety, sorry, there's a lot of graphs here because I like, just get, to, you know, I couldn't leave any of it out. Generalized anxiety is sort of. Uh, with eating disorders and PTSD, the patterns are different. So we, we can look at that as well. I'm not saying that it's, you know, I'm not saying it's one or the other. I'm just saying that actually we need to look at this. We're here to talk about meals today. OCD, again, really high in that. Our wee boys are struggling. Now, the main cause of mental health problems are the, the, the main risk factor, even, and I've studied the troubles, and this was always the most important um, predictor of mental health across the lifespan is adverse childhood experiences. So do you know about circuits of survival? What happens to you in childhood, essentially, when your brain is developing at the fastest rate, even our wee heads are getting better, you know, so quickly, and that we are soaking it all in. All the stuff that's happening there, predicts the stress response stuff throughout the lifespan. It wires in little triggers. Now we can reverse it at any stage. You know, we can train our brains to, to act differently, to respond differently. Um, but the first, the first couple of years of life, and even the, up to the age of four or five, really important in setting these thresholds. But if there's childhood adversities at that stage, then it increases the risk of poor mental health across the lifespan. And what, what do we see here when we look at childhood adversities? Look, they're nearly exact. The gender differences, look, there's no difference. There, um, it's 
So this is zero, around, you know, around 50% of the population, 56, 53, 54, have no child universities. And that's a good thing. But the other half of the population have adversities and they're equally distributed. So we must not be so things like poverty, unforgivable for one poor kids here living in poverty. That's just wrong. Like, we need to be sorting that out. But abuse, neglect, dysfunction, parental mental illness, all of that stuff can be, you know, even parenting programs can make a difference. But child adversities are experienced <laughs> in equal amounts by males and females. Um, and yet, you know, so there is no gender difference here, it just looks differently in in meals and we need to respond to that. So awareness of men's mental health difficulties, prevention. We've got to be able to identify and discuss feelings and that's about how we how we treat our wee babies and our wee kids as well. Early intervention, recognizing the signs of dysregulation. Like what does it look like? And then what do we do in response? In ourselves, our own self-awareness is part of this, but also as a society, you know. Um, and then are we are we locking up people who've been traumatized who behave in the normal natural way that anyone would behave after a lot of trauma? Is that, is that, is that what we're doing? Are we excluding them from the classrooms? And then finally, treatment. We must challenge stereotypes and we must address the stigma about talking about feelings and coming forward and asking for help. And we must provide services that um, are bespoke because we have two different behaviour patterns here and it looks different. And we have a society where stuff is stigmatised for males and we, we really need to be doing this differently. So that's my message today. I probably talked too long, um, but thank you so much for everything you're doing. I hope that was helpful. Oh, thank you.